Hi guys, this morning I've headed out to the vineyards of Stellenbosch to interview Don Price one last time before he leaves the country. Um, some of you have expressed an interest in learning a little bit more about the Kasangula ferry incident, uh, or the Kasangula incident, should I say. And so I've asked Don to talk about that and a couple of other topics as well. Enjoy. Thank you very much for watching. Hi, John. Um, yeah, and I think it was 1976, we were based, one end of company was based at uh, Vic Falls. I was in charge of the sub jock area there uh, as a senior military guy and uh, had mortars and artillery attached to me, uh, armored cars to protect the airport and so on. And um, I was in charge of that whole area down to the Matetsi River. And um, one of our areas of uh, responsibility was upstream of the falls, 60 kilometers upstream, was the Kazanguda police station, which was a little police post. And uh, it was typical sort of colonial day type police station. It was sited on the north facing banks, uh, looking uh, right on the slope facing the, the enemy territory all painted white, everything else was painted white, obviously uh, not done during the war days. Now, late 76, I believe it was October, uh, we had a little, with a police post up there at Kazangula, I would, uh, there were about six guys, six constables there under a section officer, bloke called Robbie Kemp, I believe his name was, and um, I would, give them like eight, a section of eight men and a team, uh, part of that eight men team was a little mortar team, uh, two tubes, two 81 tubes up there, little section of mortars and uh, we would protect the police station or so we thought. Anyway, sometime before the attack actually happened, um, I have had a guy, Mike Whitstock, uh, he was a sergeant from Nine are attached to me because of his mortar skills and he was in charge of the mortar teams up there and the mortar team back at uh, the falls and um, uh, we called him Mike Mortemouth, good bugger and I'll tell you a little bit more about him just now but anyway every time I went up to check out the, the scene at the, at the Kazangula police station Mike would have all this int that he would tell me and uh, Zipra were digging in on the other side and he'd make me climb up this big radio mast, uh, which was quite frightening, I must tell you, especially if you're scared of heights as I was. <laughs> and the mast would be sort of oscillating around and he'd be pointing out these positions and laughing about it and I'd be almost dying. Anyway, there was a, quite a build-up on the Zambian side, directly opposite this police station, this colonial-based sited police station. And uh, we didn't think too much about it. This was about three weeks before the attack. Uh, on the night of the attack, I sent up my sergeant major to be there uh, just to check on things, make sure things were going okay. And um, at about midnight, the boys were getting a little bit drunk, not my guys, the uh, police details and possibly the CSM because Kemp took his jungle carbine 303 out onto the veranda outside and he opened up with his rifle onto the Zambian side, firing five rounds. And that opened uh, and unleashed an almighty um, crescendo fire back at us on the Rhodesian side. The Zambians and the, and the Zipra forces that were together there had 82 mortars. They stonked the position. They had five, uh, they had, uh, sorry, 14 fives and 12 seven machine guns, B-10, 75 recoilers, and they revved the police station. In fact, they actually flattened, raised it to the ground as the, the term goes. And my guys were forced to go and get in the bunkers outside the police station. And this whole thing raged on for 16 hours. Now, when it happened, immediately it happened, uh, we were told about it back at Vic Falls. We couldn't get out there um, because fear of ambush and stuff at night. 
and hitting landmines and things. So we said, we'll, you know, try and defuse the situation. We'll come in at first light and uh, we had to leave it at that. Soon after that, the comms, all the comms went down and uh, we only managed to get in there much later on, uh, sort of mid-morning, um, about 10 or so. And I went in with the two armored cars that I had to, because there was still a, this mean fight raging on there. And uh, we, although we were returning fire, um, the orders were to try and de-escalate the situation. Uh, the powers that be were very worried about a big international scene uh, starting up at the falls again. So they wanted us to de-escalate the situation. But the falls, uh, the Kazangooza police station had been totally flattened. Uh, all the guys had moved out into these bunkers and I went in there with the armored cars and pulled the blokes out. Uh, straight after the punch-up, I was interviewed by the Chronicle um, uh, reporters, Chronicle and Herald reporters. Uh, I hadn't slept for 36 hours. It had been a hell of a thing. Uh, the guys had performed very well there. There were some minor uh, casualties on our side, but we were lucky nobody was killed. Just some very minor flesh wounds from shrapnel and stuff. And uh, my guys, I think the guy, my guy in charge of the mortars is a bloke called uh, Roy Casey. Um, they did really well and uh, we managed to pull everybody out of there and the whole thing was de-escalated and, and so on. When I was doing this interview, uh, it comes straight out of the bush there, uh, drenched in sweat and so on. And I borrowed a shirt from a, a blue job that was there. So when you see the photograph of me in the newspaper, people say, boy, you've got a tight-fitting shirt there. <laughs> didn't fit me, but I didn't have an option. So uh, yeah, that is why that was there. Some other points of interest there, you know, the big thing was that this Robbie Kemp guy uh, acted totally um, irrationally and caused a tremendous big problem. He was posted immediately off to some far distant uh, location uh, and I'm sure was a was given, was charged in the police. I don't know, I didn't follow up on it. But uh, it really was a, a mean stonk. We, you know, they were firing white phosphorus bombs at us, incendiary bombs, and the place was burning. And the 75 and the B-10s on open sites, you can imagine, were just taking out big chunks of the walls and so on of the police station. So it was a hell of a deal. And in the end, the only place to be was in the two bunkers. Uh, and that's where I found my guys when I went in there. When I went in with the armored cars, the 12-7 uh, rounds were ricocheting off the bodywork and we dived in there and pulled the guys out. Um, it really wasn't a very good scene, but uh, like I say, it lasted for 16 hours and was, was quite a deal. Uh, just a bit to talk on a, a digress a bit slightly on uh, Mike Woodstock. Uh, he was a territorial who was attached to me and his uh, wife Lynette came up to visit him. She was very pregnant at the time and uh, while she was up there, it was a long weekend, she came from Bulawa. Um, it looked like she might miscarriage. So we had to quickly make a plan. I talked to the Blue Job counterpart there. The Lynx was going back to Guela that day. So I asked him if we would dogleg it back through via Bulawa and he said he would. And he did this, dropped off Mike's wife, and she was in hospital, and uh, the baby arrived early. Uh, the reason I'm telling you this is because it, uh, it'll become obvious just now, although I won't go into it too much. Uh, they had a little daughter, her name was Charlene. She was later to become a princess, uh, married to royalty, and uh, did very well in the swimming side and so on. So it was, it's a small world. and. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, that's where I played a little part there. Um, yeah, talking back at the falls again, you know, the falls used to get stonked several, several times a week. Uh, mortars and uh, small arms fire from the Zambian side, from the zipper positions. All the windows were taped uh, with clear tape and so on, so that the, the glass wouldn't shatter in, it would be held and so on. We would had a hit cab that we would attack, uh, counter attack with. And we had, of course, artillery pieces sighted behind at spray view, which we would engage the targets with, and mortars. Uh, whenever the camp was, uh, the town was attacked, 
the drill was that I would uh, phone uh, John Honman, who was a very, uh, he was a police reservist, but he had his own Cherokee Sundowner aircraft. And doesn't matter what time it was, two in the morning or whatever, him and Dickie Bradshaw, his technician from Ruach, would and myself would get airborne and we would uh, fly with no lights on, obviously. Uh, and we're, But we were still subject to some fire from the Zambian side. And we would pinpoint the positions and call in the military strikes like an FOO. And that worked pretty well. And, and we had two tremendous friends there. And I put them up for medals, uh, which they got. John Honman and Dickie Bradshaw, both gone now, but both very good guys. Yeah. Sure. Don, why don't you talk a bit about the recce work that you that you used to do? Was it at Vic Falls? Well, it was wherever we were based at the time. But yes, it was started at the falls. And... Um, I trained up my own recce team there. Uh, one of the beauties about being a boss of an independent company, you could do really what you wanted as long as you didn't uh, uh, make or get into any trouble. Otherwise, obviously, you'd be in, in, the, in for the high jump with the authorities. But if you, if you came through and won on the situation or whatever you did, uh, it was only all praise and so on. So. I tried to do, try to think out of the barrel the whole time, try to do different things. And one of the tasks that I did was to form a recce team. Uh, these, this was also my trackers. And it started off with two of us, myself and Theo Nell. Uh, Theo was possibly one of the best soldiers I ever worked with, apart from Daryl Watt and a few other guys. You know, there were a lot of good soldiers around, but some that I had a lot of time <coughs> with. Theo was one of those guys and Theo and I, would work as a two-man recce team, uh, both across uh, from Kazangula, from the rapids at Kazangula, the Katambora Rapids. We would cross in low season when the river was low. You could cross the falls there at night in a zigzag pattern. You could go across on the rocks and go into Zambia. We did work there where we uh, had int about a house on the Zambian side, um, which was said to contain a couple of high-ranking Zipra personnel. We did the recce and we eventually ascertained uh, through our binoculars and so on and close-in work that it was Demisa de Bengwa and Lookout Masuku who were based in, sure. this, in this house. So it, it was quite a big find and we, we put that into cross back and then the squadron took it over and were watching it and I don't know what happened in the end but I think they may have moved those guys. But that kind of work, and then we did a lot of work in Botswana, because Botswana was used mainly as a base for Zipra uh, insurgents in the transit phase of their operations into Rhodesia, either coming in on the Matetsi side or going further down and crossing in the Plum Tree side. Right. Um, we had some very, very close calls there. I spoke about the one thing. Uh, in the first um, in the first interview, um, but we did some very good work there, and a lot of that was followed up uh, by the SAS guys. Uh, we also did the um, myself and Ronnie van Heerden, which I spoke about briefly, did the sniping work at Kazangulo after they had uh, burnt down Elephant Hills, where we fired across the river at 760 meters and took out several targets there. I think I took out four and Ronnie took out three or vice versa. I'm not sure now. Um, we had with us a section of uh, SAS guys. They had been across the night before and put AP mines and landmines in on all the roads. It was, it was fairly interesting listening to the radio work which we did later once we got pulled out from our position on the river after we'd done the sniping and initiated the attack on the ferry and sunk the ferry. Um, we sat on the ridge behind and uh, monitored uh, what was going on on the Zambian side and the reaction to the attack, you know, uh, on the ferry. And it was very funny because um, the Zambian army were deployed all up and down the Zambezi River and every now and again uh, there was this panic type um, intercoms going on, you know, we've been attacked and they've taken us. 
vehicles out and the guys have just stepped on a landmine and so on and so on. And then in the middle of all of that would be, hello Zero, this is one, uh, we need the beer re resupply and this kind of thing <laughs> right in the middle of it. So the guys were um, in fits of laughter and, and enjoyed it. We were waiting um, because on the radio we heard that the Zambian Air, Air Force had been scrambled and was going to come and attack us on the Rhodesian side. And although this was reported on the radio, it never happened. Okay. Um, yeah, that's the kind of work we did in the, with the recce teams and so on. Don, one of the questions I've been asked is when you, when you go on a recce, uh, like let's say you're going to cross now over into Zambia, what sort of kit did you take with you? Did you take like a TR-48 radio or? No, when, when, we, when we did our reccees and the recce work we did was very short term. Like it wasn't long term recce, it would be a couple of nights. And we'd go as light as possible, probably uh, at SKS, webbing, chest webbing for some rations, peanuts, raisins, uh, that kind of thing. No, no hot stuff, no little cooker or anything like that. Uh, water bottle and uh, either a pistol or a AKM folding butt. Um, took very, very light equipment uh, and one small radio, uh, A63. VHF comms so we can, can talk to our crowd on the on the home side, on the Rhodesian side. Mm. But of interest to note that uh, with all those reccees and that work that we did externally, we did not have any support from anybody. I mean, we didn't have hot extraction of choppers standing by to come and get us or whatever, whatever. Right, right. It was all highly illegal, so we were on our own and we took a lot of chances, but mm. uh, it paid off in the end. Yeah, and foot, footwear? Footwear, um, I was a great believer of the old um, uh, tacky boot of the old pro, uh, Super Pro. Okay. SAS had their clandestine boots, clandestine, but the trouble with those was they had the sole was plain, uh, but you slipped on anything that was wet or uh, slippery surface, you know, they, it, yeah, was, yeah. it was very difficult. And the other time we operated barefoot. Sure. Uh, because uh, for you can imagine if you do a recce around a camp uh, guys come out the next day or whatever reason they have to leave that camp and they are doing a clearance patrol around their camp and they see bootwear <coughs> uh, straight away you compromise so yeah. whenever we did close in work on the camps it was always barefoot uh, a lot of the time to condition your feet to becoming harder uh, this was an old thing that I learned from the Mau Mau days, from the forces that operated in Kenya. You'd put your feet in a bath of permagnet to potash mm. uh, for several hours a day and it then dry and it would harden your feet, you know. I so, it also dyes them brown. It, it does, yeah, yeah. So we'd have <laughs> these psychedelic feet, <laughs> but it does make them hard, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I remember sitting with my feet in for making that a potash solution, that purple water. Yeah. One of the things I'd like to touch on, uh, and my late wife brought it up to me uh, back in Civvy Street after the war, said, you know, what she couldn't believe or she couldn't, thinking back on things as she looked at the war and the times that we'd gone through and all that, was how young everybody was and the responsibilities that these young men had on their shoulders during that war phase. And uh, I think that was very pertinent and very true. Um, we didn't, when you think about sub jock commander like I was, one end of company, I was sent to, to Victoria Falls, that whole town of Victoria Falls, all the way back to the Matetsi River, uh, all the way up the Zambezi River, up on the Botswana border, all the way to Kazangula Ferry Crossing, all the way back down to Vic Falls, 300 square kilometer bit, roughly. All the farmers in that area, uh, all the police, all the veterinary services, all the government departments, uh, all came under me internal because affairs. internal affairs, all that, because I was the, uh, it was martial law time and I was the military commander in the area and uh, quite something at the time, everybody just handled it and didn't think anything of it, you know, but yeah, you were, I was, I believe at Vic Falls, I was like um, 30 years old. And when I left there and went to Bite Bridge uh, with all my dealings with the South African Defence Force and the South African uh, Ministers of Defence and so on, 
think about all of that. You, you're 30 years old and you're dealing with these people and making all these uh, decisions um, at that young age. So I think she was right. I think there was a tremendous, but not only from the command structure, but all the way down. You know, when you look at pictures now of the lads as they were fighting and uh, they looked like little schoolboys with MAGs and so on. And, uh, and that is why I think the RLI uh, during Op Cauldron got that high praise from uh, Sergeant Major Herod when he said, uh, we look like boys, but we fought like lions. Mm, mm, yeah, so true. I think it's just something that people don't realize in a war, you have to grow up very fast and you have to have these huge responsibilities. Uh, you know, the average kid of 35 today has, hasn't even touched what young people in that time did. And I think uh, it's something, it's very, um, uh, it's a platform that sets you up for life uh, in later life, you know, and it helps you. But it's something you didn't, I didn't think about until it was pointed out to me.